Welcome to Ancient Greece and Persia, 2000 BC until 479 BC. This is Melinda Cole Klein. Greece created a society that fundamentally shaped Western civilization. From an inhospitable environment, it fostered a culture that eventually spread its essence, concepts, and values across the world. The history of the Greeks and their culture is divided into two broad periods, named Hellenistic, from approximately 2000 BC to the unification of Greece under Macedonian rule by 338 BC with the coming of Philip II and later his son Alexander the Great. The second period is Alexander's achievement for Greece and the spread of their culture from the Mediterranean to North Africa to Southern Europe and Asia as well from 336 BC. This period the Hellenistic era comprised the Alexander years and end with the Roman conquest of the Hellenistic East, formerly belonging to the Persian Empire. This presentation explores Greek history, aspects of culture, their politics, warfare, and who's who from 2000 BC until the Greek classical period after the Battle of Salamis, which was a significant war with Persia to end all wars in which Greece was victorious in 480 BC. At 479, this begins Greek classical period. With peace at hand, they developed an independent society until Philip II conquered the Greek city-states at the Battle of Cherchonia in 338 BC, 140 years later. The remarkable story of ancient Greek civilization begins with the arrival of the Greeks around 1900 BC. The characteristic institutions of ancient Greek life, the polis or the city-state had emerged. Greek civilization flourished and reached its height by the 8th century BC that characterized this time. By the 600s BC, Greek civilization flourished and reached its height in the classical era. But the inability of the Greek city-states to end their warring among other Greek city-states eventually left them vulnerable for invasion and defeat by outsiders. This was accomplished by the Macedonian king Philip II and helped to bring an end to the era of independent Greek city-states. The Greeks called their homeland Hellas. Home was a rocky, mountainous peninsula. Greece is composed past and present of the mainland and islands nearby in the Aegean Sea. The Greek climate tends to be rather dry on the land, including rivers and creeks by the summer. However, Greece is a land with good harbors, so like colonial Massachusetts centuries later, the Greeks took to the sea to trade and engage in commerce across long distances. Greece was divided culturally and politically because of its difficult terrain, but united in their ethnicity. This is language, government structure, and their cultural practices and politics. Distant city-states varied in their politics. Some were more democratic than others. Greek people were shaped by their environment. Their soil was poor, mountainous, rocky, and dry, but they produced specialty items as a surplus such as olive oil, pottery, and wine. Greeks imported much of their food from Egypt and Mesopotamia, 
for grain and other commodities. These two river civilizations were older than the Greek city-states. Greeks borrowed their technology and ideas and improved upon them, making them Greek. In the scheme of things, Greece was on the fringe of the civilized world. This allowed them to develop into a culture independently. The first Greek civilization dates back to about 2000 BC with the arrival of the Minoans into Greek lands. They are considered the first Europeans. Historians are not sure where they came from exactly. The Minoans were sea traders and fishermen. They exported pottery, wine, and olive oil. Around 1400 BC, their civilization disappeared or was conquered. This was accomplished by the Mycenaeans, the first Greeks. Unlike the Minoans, they had Greek language and religion. In 1600, they came from the north of Greece and conquered the Minoan civilization. By 1100 BC, all Mycenaean cities were destroyed. Clay and stone tablets survive, stating Mycenaeans expected to be attacked. Barbarians took over. These are non-civilized people from where it is not certain, perhaps, other parts of the European continent. In essence, there was a civil war and the invaders won. The intellectual, artistic, and political Greek center no longer existed. What followed for 300 years between 1100 and 800 was the Archaic Age. It was a time of no learning or political structures. You could call it a Dark Age. 90% of Greeks disappeared or were killed by the invaders. There was no trading and cities were not repopulated. With the Greek people went their civilization and art. Architecture stopped. The population lost the skill to read and write during this time. On the east coast of present-day Turkey, as legend reveals, existed a city that Greeks in the 12th century BC could not conquer. This was Troy. In the 1870s, the German archaeologist Heinrich Schlickmann excavated the area. However, scholars dispute this area as a legendary city, adversary of Greek city-states. Nonetheless, UNESCO has declared that the ruins found were of world heritage value and it was declared a site by 1998. The story of the Trojans first became in myth and then in legend. Greek myth and storytelling was handed down for posterity and the story of Troy and the Trojans. Although located on the Asia Minor, legend has it Troy was a city-state and Greek-like in their culture, politics, and economy. Troy was a wealthy and prosperous city-state. Because of seagoing trade, its population imported expensive material goods, pursued advances in metallurgy, in particular iron production, and engaged in massive building projects such as high defensive walls and water systems. As the legend has it, Electra and Zeus started the Trojan royal family. One generation before the Trojan War, Hercules captured Troy. He killed the royal sons except for Priam, who was allowed to live. Priam later became king. During his reign, the Mycenaean Greeks invaded and captured Troy in the Trojan War, dating to about 1250 BC. This has come down in legend and Hollywood films of recent years as the fall of Troy and the story of the Trojan horse 
as written by Homer, or perhaps his students. During the Trojan War, the son of Priam, Hector, fought the fierce and most handsome warrior Achilles. Hector lost and was immortalized in Homer's Iliad. As the story goes, Achilles was child of a king of southern Thessaly, a southern Greek region, and a sea nymph, Thetius. Thetius was desired by two gods for her hand in marriage, both Zeus and Poseidon. According to Greek legend, she was told by another god, Prometheus, the firebringer, that she would bear a son greater than his father. The two gods bowed out of the pitcher, allowing the Greek king to marry this sea nymph. After all, no father would want his son to usurp his power and authority. Nonetheless, the legend implies that Zeus not Peleus, was the father of Achilles. Fearing that her son might be killed someday because he was half mortal, Thetius held Achilles by his ankles and dipped him into the river Styx. In the process, his heels never got wet, creating a vulnerable spot. Ultimately, he was injured with an arrow through the heel during the Trojan War. Achilles refused medical treatment according to the legend. Unlike what is shown in the film about Troy with Brad Pitt, and I have to say one of my very favorite films, the legendary Achilles survives and lives on becoming Homer's romantic and handsome hero of the Trojan War. The Iliad and the Odyssey, the first great epic poems of early Greece, were based on oral stories that had been passed down from generation to generation. Most historians believe Homer took this into account as evidence, and he used this evidence, or perhaps his student assistants used this evidence, and composed the Iliad, the epic poem of the Trojan War. As a brief overview, the war was caused when Paris, the second son of Priam, a prince of Troy, abducted Helen, wife of the king of the Greek state of Sparta, outraging Greeks. We can only imagine the political implications of this act. Of course, as remember, this prompted the Trojan War. Under the leadership of Spartan's king's brother, Agamemnon of Mycenae, the Greeks attacked Troy. After ten years of combat, the Greeks finally sacked the city. The Iliad is not so much the story of the war itself as it is the tale of the Greek hero Achilles and how the, quote, wrath or desire to kill Achilles, end of quote, led to disaster. The Mycenaeans were above all a warrior people who prided themselves on their heroic deeds in battle. Mycenaean civilization flourished from 1600 to 1100 BC. The most famous of all their supposed military adventures has come down to us in this epic poem by Homer. By 1000 BC, the Greek Mycenaeans as a culture and society were dying. As a result, the Greek world entered into a dark age. But among scholars, the Iliad and Homer's Odyssey, these epic poems describe Greek social conditions. In the Homeric view, Greece was a society based on agriculture in which a land-based warrior aristocracy controlled much wealth and exercised considerable power. The story of Odysseus is one of my personal favorites. 
As a read and film, it is classic. After fighting at Troy, Odysseus tries to get home. This epic journey to get home that would take 10 years, he would struggle with decisions that we still do today. Shall I stay with this temptress for years and learn her secrets about life that will make me a better man? Or should I leave and return to my wife and people straight away? How best can I protect my men to ensure their safety for a return home? This Homeric tale is not only interesting but evaluates human qualities we consider present day issues. Additionally, Homeric tales teach loyalty, duty, history, and honor. The Odyssey illustrates Greek social structure and what it meant to be an intelligent man, often having to make tough decisions, and a dedicated ruler. All the while, the women in this text play powerful roles. Penelope, the wife and queen to Odysseus, is so creative, she is able to put off male advances to marry her. After all, Odysseus was considered dead because he was gone so long. Thus, Greek women are shown in this epic as unyielding loyal, while other women are powerful demigods and sexual temptresses. Women in the Greek world were power players and often, or rather quite often, very beautiful. Homer did not so much record history as he made it. Greeks regarded the Iliad and Odyssey as authentic history, as they became basic texts for education of Greeks for hundreds of years from about 500 BC. When was the Iliad written, perhaps? It is believed it was written at the end of the 700s or the beginning of the 600s BC. And here lies the significance. These epic poems by Homer gave later Greeks a legendary past filled with heroes to which these texts became standardized in educating Greek males. These poems instilled in youths the aristocratic values of courage and honor and that it was vital to strive for excellence befitting a hero. This honor was sought through contest or struggle. This hero had to have the willingness to fight, protect his family and friends, and protect his own and his family's honor as well. Male honor and masculine warrior traditions carried down in the West over the centuries honoring such behavior and self-sacrifice. This cultural heritage laid the foundation of values adopted by small groups who fought and protected its citizenry, honored with lands and titles. The aristocracy that has survived into the modern age was founded and endured from heroic principles. For the rest of us commoners, we have been taught over the centuries to model our behavior after our social betters. Homer's texts have been used for centuries when educating youths. This cultural heritage bound Greeks together in shared traditions and in time spread across the West. Greek people during the Archaic Age made a dramatic recovery in their culture, politics, art, and society. Greece became populated again with Greek speakers, with their religion and culture. We are not sure where they came from, but the population skyrocketed, and with it, urban growth resulted. Once again, the Greeks traded with other Mediterranean peoples. In addition, 
They created port colonies in Italy, Spain, and Egypt, which spread Greek culture. At the same time, they borrowed technologies from foreigners and improved upon them, as formerly mentioned. This advanced Greek civilization. At this time, during the Archaic Age, they learned about the alphabet. The most important technology imported into the Greek culture at this time was iron. The introduction of iron as forged metal was made into necessary items that include armor and also weapons. This technology created a new type of Greek soldier, the hoplite. The introduction of armor and the introduction of the hoplite led to the creation of the polis, a unique type of city-state where soldiers became the political citizens. Only hoplites, free Greek men, could vote. Iron armor replaced the use of expensive copper armor with stronger tendencies and less expensive at the same time. This allowed more male Greek citizens access to political power by becoming hoplites. All hoplites were self-funded soldiers. They provided their own armor and weapons. If wealthier, they brought with them a horse and became an officer in the cavalry. It is important to remember that Greek states did not pay wages to their soldier or pay for hoplite equipment. It was the soldiers that did this. They would be the ones then who should decide the fate of the state or the direction of the government because they had made an investment in the government and its direction. While Greek hoplites enlisted from across the social classes, they had to have money to do the following if a hoplite. Number one, afford to be away from home. He was, by being a hoplite, he created no wages for his family. He had to, number two, he had to provide his own equipment. Number three, be ready to fight and die for the homeland. And number four, he had to train to be effective and of course survive. Thus, hoplites were from wealthy to middle-class families. These men were the politicians of the many Greek states that would evolve during the Archaic Age. So to attain success, authority, and power, you had to become a hoplite. Each polis, a city-state, was run by hoplites. By 500 BC, there were about 1,000 of these types of city-states in Greece, the ancestor of both the modern city and state, and persisted well into Roman times. City-state residents recognized as citizens would have lived in towns or in the countryside. The Greeks did not regard the polis as a territorial grouping so much as a religious and political association. All the while, a polis would control other territories contributing to their political power. Modifications of the Latin word polis are common in many modern European languages. This is indicative of the influence of the polis-centered Greek traditions of politics, religion, and justice, along with social practices. The following are a few examples of words in English that include policy, polite, police, metropolis, and politics. Each polis was run by an assembly of citizens. They ran political affairs. They had no kings or dictators. Rules were made by the assemblies. If a citizen attended, 
he could enter the political debates, introduce legislation, and vote. This was the world's first democracy, and it was a direct democracy, not the form of representative democracy we have here in the United States. The following is a definition of Greek citizenship shared in each polis by tradition and law. Women, slaves, servants, and children. People dependent on the economy of the property owner, such as the hoplite husband, employer, or father for their survival, these people were not citizens. Property owners, having made an investment in their communities and paid taxes to support that community or city-state, were seen as its citizen base. But voting also came to hoplites, who served in the Greek military campaigns. Aliens, non-Greek people, not even their children or grandchildren, would be Greek and therefore were non-citizens. And this also was tied to those that were considered slaves. Democracy was practiced by voting populations. In Sparta, it was 10% of the population, therefore an oligarchy. Wealthy male elite hoplites controlled and dominated politics and the fate of the polis. Athens was more democratic as their voting base was 20%. Free Greek male hoplites and composing of landowning males in particular. By 500 BC the polis was in place and believed to be the greatest system of civilization. On the Mediterranean Sea the standard vessel by the 6th century BC was the trireme. It was a long skinny vessel made of wood with an iron front. Not a lot of strategy needed in warfare. The aim was to punch a hole in the other boats and the last one left standing won. For the Persians, navy rowers were slaves and convicted criminals who were to be killed anyway. Greeks used freemen in their navy and were more careful about sea battles. More concern over loss of life by admirals is evident in their testimonies and their courage. As compared to the Persians who were willing to risk the lives of Persian slaves. On land, Greeks had iron helmets, breastplate, a short sword, a shield, and above all a spear. The short sword was the second weapon of choice by hoplites, used in a stabbing instrument motion coming from behind the shield. They fought in a phalanx, a rectangular formation pattern protected on their flanks by Greek soldiers on horseback. This was the officer cavalry corps. Greek and Persian phalanx advanced in an organized fashion towards each other, ultimately crashing together with their spears. The formation left standing together ran over the losers who were running away. Thus, losers were the ones who broke formation and caused chaos within their ranks. The use of chariots went out of style by 1150 BC, but later would be used in chariot games by the Romans, and also by the Byzantine Empire at the Hippodrome. These were spectator sports requiring great skill. Elephants were used in Africa and in India in ancient times for warfare on land as well. By the 500s BC, the Persian Empire was the greatest in the Mediterranean. Under their king, Cyrus II, it enjoyed unity for 30 years and expanded in size. This was accomplished by conquering weaker territories, 
bringing these areas into the empire and making them subject to Persian rule. They had to pay taxes to Persia. When called, they had to serve in the army or navy. If territorial peoples did this, they were left alone. Persian rule kept the peace. But most people hated the Persians. Fear kept the people alive, but conquered. In 1540 BC, the army of Cyrus II conquered Ionia. This area, south of what has been Troy, is believed to be a post-Trojan area comprising of Greek citizens along the coast of present-day Turkey in a collection of smaller cities. In 499, the Ionian Greeks rose up in rebellion against Persian rule. They sent messengers to Greek city-states asking for help. Everyone said no. Greece at this time was not yet united. The only two of the polises that responded to help the Ionians were Athens and Eritrea. They sent hoplites and triremes. However, five years later, in 494 BC, the rebellion had been crushed. Persia was victorious over Ionia. Darius I, the king of Persia at this point, vowed to make an example out of the loyalty of Eritrea and Athens and their stand against mighty Persia. In 490 BC, Darius had his opportunity for revenge. He sent an army of 20,000 soldiers to Greece. His navy sailed along the coast of Greece in a northerly, westerly fashion. First stop was Eritrea. These people were given a message from the king using a courier to surrender or be defeated. The Eritreans decided to fight for their freedom. However, the Persian army easily defeated this small polis, captured it, and then burnt it to the ground. They killed the captured soldiers and sold the Eritrean women and children into slavery a thousand miles away in the Persian Gulf. Eritrea was never rebuilt. From Eritrea, the Persian army navy sailed around the Greek coast to Marathon, a port city on the eastern side, from which it was 26 miles through a valley to Athens. In an advance warning, Persians advised the Athenians to surrender and serve the Persian king, Darius I. Remember, Athens was a democracy. There did not exist a strong, single male figure to lead them into battle or persuade them. However, their assembly of men deliberated over the present situation. 6,000 Athenian citizens debated to fight or surrender. And they chose to fight. The message returned via a Greek courier and was run the 26 mile distance back to Marathon, relaying the following, quote, we know you are great, but our love of freedom is great. We must fight. End of quote. In the meantime, Athens asked other city-states for help. The answer was no. They were going to battle the Persians on their own. Athens had 10,000 hoplites to Persia's 20,000. The Greek hoplites marched out the 26 miles on their way to meet up with the Persian army. Well, let me tell you, there was a huge upset. The Athenians won against the mighty Persian army. 7,000 Persians were killed and the rest fled because they had broke the formation. 
132, believe it or not, Greek hoplites died. Five reasons for victory in 490 BC by the Athenians at the Battle of Marathon. I would like you to remember these. Number one, free men and citizens of a state fight harder and better than slaves. Number two, the Athenians were yelling at the Persian soldiers, quote, all Persians are slaves to the state except the king, end of quote. And this was an attempt to demoralize them, basically telling them what they were doing was pointless. Number three, Athenians had the hometown advantage. They knew their geography and the lay of the land. They knew the best places from which to attack, just as an example. Number four, they had an advantage in regards to morale. The Athenians were psyched up for this. Plus, if they lost, they would lose their beautiful city and all their families would be no more. Number five, most importantly, Greeks had hoplite armor, weapons, and were well trained. The Persians were slaves, had no armor. They were usually equipped with one weapon, and meanwhile the Greeks had two weapons plus armor. The Persians were typically farmers and not professional soldiers. While they lost at Marathon, the Persian king and his son did not lose the dream of taking revenge on Athens. Six years after the battle, the son, heir, and new king of Persia, Xerxes, succeeded his father. For ten years after the Battle of Marathon, there was not war between the Greeks and the Persians. In 484 BC, a fortunate thing happened in Athens. A large deposit of silver was found. Anyone aiming to defend themselves against Persia would welcome the opportunity to enlarge their defensive military plans and preparations for invasion. The Athenian Political Assembly of Hotlights met to deliberate over this situation. The Miscalese an important Athenian politician stated, quote, I think the Persians are coming back. We must be prepared. End of quote. Themiscales stated that they would need a new navy requiring the construction of new triremes. So they did. In 480 BC, when Xerxes was coming back, the Athenians had 200 new ships. Xerxes was ready too. He had the strongest army in history with 200,000 soldiers, a navy with 600 triremes, the biggest navy in history, unless of course you could count the legendary 1,000 Greek ships that landed on the Trojan beaches sometime around 1250 BC. The Greeks knew Xerxes was coming. Greeks sent out word to others to help. Other policies joined in the fight by sending hoplites and triremes, including their longtime enemy Sparta. Now the Greeks had 40,000 hoplites and 400 triremes. Obviously, they knew they were outnumbered. Without resistance, Persians would take Athens and burn it to the ground. The Greek navy waits in a narrow channel for the Persian navy off the coast of the island of Salamis. Remember, triremes don't turn very well. They are designed for ramming. Themiscales sent a message to Xerxes to trick him. He stated, quote, I am a traitor. I want to help you, end of quote. Xerxes, the not-so-bright, not-so-smart ruler, 
that he thought he was. He definitely was not the man his father was. He agreed to meet with the Miscalese at Salamis by sailing in. Xerxes fell for the deception. The Persians lost the naval battle. After a final land war at Plataea in 479, the Persians are driven out of Greece for good, never to return. This allows the Greeks to develop independently. This was the start of the Greek classical age.